Well, good morning, everyone. And on behalf of uh, the Brazelton family and our church family, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, please don't underestimate the significance of you showing up. Um, being here to mourn with those who mourn is a ministry of presence that you bring with you that is a picture of the body of Christ in action. So it is good that you're here and that we're really thankful that you're here. And we're here to grieve together, but we are also here to celebrate Big Shelley. We want to celebrate her life. That's twofold. We want to celebrate uh, the incredible life that she lived. And equally so, we want to celebrate the life that she lives right now in heaven with Jesus. So in light of that glorious truth, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, we are so thankful for Shelley Brazelton. We are thankful for the way that you made her exactly the way that you made her, that allowed her to be a blessing to so many people. We thank you for redeeming her and making her your beloved daughter. Uh, we thank you for the ways that she blessed all who knew her and many who didn't. We thank you that even at her own memorial service, we get to enjoy being in a beautiful building that has her fingerprints all over it. And so this morning, we come to you and we ask that you would enable us to grieve with great hope. We pray that your nearness would give comfort and peace that surpasses human understanding. We also ask, Lord, that you would give us a hopeful, heavenly perspective as we honor Shelley and as we glorify you. We pray all of these things in the sufficient, strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, friends, we are going to sing some of Shelley's favorite hymns this morning, but, but I've been asked to kind of give you a little coaching before we do that. Uh, many of you have been to many memorial services, and maybe the expectation is that you would listen quietly uh, as, we, as the people on the stage sing, but that is not what Shelley wanted. Uh, she was very clear that she wanted this to be celebratory, and she wanted all of you to sing really loud. Uh, our sister in Christ, Shelley, has taken her place in the great cloud of witnesses, so let's all stand and sing the gospel with joy this morning. Jordan Stormy Banks. On Jordan Stormy Banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie.
When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? Oh, I am bound, I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. I am bound, I am bound, I am bound for the promised land. I'm bound.
Uh, my name is Fred Brazelton. I'm the, uh, I'm the youngest of Lou and Shelley's uh, four children. Uh, and I will go ahead and uh, preempt a question that might be swirling out there, which is, uh, I'm not the pastor and I'm not the car guy. <laughs> Uh, you'll hear from those two later on. Uh, speaking of the pastor, my extended family has sat in those exact seats for about 20 years, and we've listened, we've listened to West uh, uh, have, you know, tell sermons. And I swear, uh, I can tell when he's running out of material because he concocts some embarrassing story about the family or, or airs some uh, family dirty laundry to make a point. <laughs> and it, it drove my mom crazy and she was always saying, what can we do to get back to him, to get back at him? So I think if it were up to her, she would want me to use this bully pulpit to get back at, <laughs> to get back at West and vindicate the family. But I'm going to take the high road and focus on my mom. <laughs> so um, I, I really do think we are here to uh, celebrate a, a life well lived. Uh, they don't make them like my mom anymore. She was this unique combination of adventurous, fiery, stubborn, funny, irreverent, authentic, and incredibly loving. Uh, Tuesday night, our whole family got together, our extended family, and we all told our favorite Big Shelly stories. It was so much fun. Uh, there are two stories, uh, there are too many stories to recount here, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick a a couple just to give you all a sense of what it was like to live with her on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there was a time my sister Shelly uh, was dating, here we go, uh, there, uh, was dating this young lawyer named Jeff Bracken. And Jeff and Shelly had a couple dates, and then Shelly invited Jeff over to the house to meet the family. Uh, after a few minutes of, of small talk, uh, Mom looked at Jeff and said, Jeff, I have a very important question. Jeff said, yes, ma'am, what is it? Are you sexually attracted to my daughter? <laughs> Jeff, like any good lawyer, assessed the situation and realized there was no good answer to that question. <laughs> Mom was uh, typically a very kind person. That is, unless you crossed her, or more importantly, any of her children. Uh, she would quickly turn into a mama grizzly bear, uh, and she had two phrases that she often used in these situations. One was, damn it to hell, <laughs> and the other one was, whoever the offending party was uh, could stick it where the sun doesn't shine. <laughs> her salty tongue was often hilarious, but it sometimes got her into trouble. Um, I remember when Jessica and I were young parents and mom invited our daughter Avery over for a sleepover. Avery was just three or four years old at the time and, and Jessica was the typical overprotective first-time parent. Jessica worried, would Avery go to bed too late? Would she eat unhealthy food? Would she have her favorite baby doll tucked just you know, right in at bed the, the way she liked it when she went to bed? All these things you worry about or stress about with a first child, but she could care less about on child number three. <laughs> I assured Jessica that mom was a pro and everything would be just fine. When we went to pick up Avery the next morning, she looked healthy and happy, and I was relieved that the sleepover happened without incident, or so I thought. About halfway through the drive home, Avery dropped her baby doll on the floor of the car and with perfect timing yelled, damn it to hell. <laughs> Uh, invaluable life lessons from Big Shelly started early. <laughs> it's been really fun the last few days to read all the texts and emails about how mom impacted so many people. I believe the reason people loved her so much is because she was so authentic. There was no pretense, she did not mince words, and you knew exactly where she stood on an issue. And she would normally have you crying with laughter by the end of the conversation. My friends, a lot of them who are here today, adored her, and she adored them. Um, she loved nothing more than being with family or friends at their place in Hunt, Texas, 
or on a good South Texas bird shoot. As a young kid, we would hunt together, sitting side by side at a dove tank. Class was in, was in session, and she would talk about birds, trees, cactus, which was her favorite, and shooting things, and all sorts of other topics. What a cool mom, and I loved these times. The only problem was that the teacher was not always honest. <laughs> For many years, I believed that Dove were attracted to cigarette smoke, because that is what she told me every time she lit a new cigarette. <laughs> Most of you know that side of mom. That's why this room is full. I wanted to talk about two aspects of her life that might not be as well known. The first is her marriage. Mom and dad lived out a 62-year love story. I will, I will say that absolutely no one would write a how-to book on marriage based on their relationship. There, there were no daily post-it notes professing their love or romantic getaways. But what they had worked perfectly for them. Dad told me a funny story a few days ago about the time he told his mother, whose name was Dottie, uh, that he was going to marry Shelly. Dottie replied that Shelly was nice, but she was a little crazy. <laughs> uh, Dad, who is famously responsible and organized, told Dottie that he would straighten her out and fix her within 90 days of marriage. When Dottie passed away over 25 years later, she told Lou that he clearly needed more time. <laughs> well, Dad, I guess 62 years wasn't enough time either, and I believe everyone in this room is glad you didn't straighten her out. It was such a blessing to me and my siblings to watch their marriage, through the ups and the downs, and to see how their commitment and perseverance developed into such a strong marriage that, that got better every year. Dad, you loved her so well. Partic particularly these last few years, as her health declined. So everyone was worried about Dad going into retirement. They didn't know what he was going to do. And the reality is, he spent a lot of his time taking care of Mom. And that was beautiful. He found some time for some pickleball as well, but that's besides the point. Dad, Mom loved you so much, and the relationship you had for 62 years is truly a gift to be grateful for. The second topic I want to discuss is, is Mom's faith in, faith in Jesus. As most of you know, Mom was not a regular churchgoer for much of her life. She had an independent streak, an aversion to anything that resembled authority, and those traits can sometimes run counter to the whole concept of faith. You know the story in the Bible about J Jacob wrestling with God all night? That was my mom. But God, West, and many others continued to work on her to soften her heart and accept God's grace, and it worked. As most of you know, mom smoked cigarettes for over 50 years and had a bad case of COPD that caused her health decline, to decline the last few years. For years, she tried everything in her own power to quit, but she just couldn't do it on her own. She told me she finally reached the end of her rope and got down on her knees and asked God to take over. She quit cold turkey that day. God works. God works. Sorry. I told my son to give me a sign if I was losing it, and he's <laughs> falling asleep over there. Uh, God works in mysterious ways, and both mom and I believe that the very thing that caused her health to be so challenging her last few years led to a complete dependence on God and a joy that will last for eternity. That's a pretty good trade in my book. The, the night mom died, I was in her dressing room and I found a quote by C.S. Lewis that she had scribbled on a piece of paper. It read, If you think of this world as a place intended solely for our happiness, you will find it quite intolerable. 
Think of it as a place of training and correction, and it's not so bad. I think mom was well trained. I will wrap up by saying, and I know I speak for my siblings, that I feel like I won the lottery. I feel like a I feel like I won the lottery having her as a mom. God created her to be a mom and a grandmother. She taught me that the greatest gift a parent can give a, a child is, is unconditional love. Everything else is secondary. She delivered that gift of unconditional love to my doorstep every day of my life. While mom may not be here physically anymore, her legacy her legacy of love, faith, fun, and a little bit of crazy <laughs> will live on for generations through her children, their spouses, and, and her grandchildren. How awesome is that? Mom, I'm so grateful for you. I feel so lucky, and I want you to know that my prayer is when I die that my three kids, Avery, Bess, and Lewis uh, feel the same way about me, that, about me and Jessica, uh, as I do about mom and dad. Thank you. Well, I am Lewis Brazelton. I am not the pastor, and I'm obviously not the good-looking one. Uh, but I did have the best, best mom ever, and I know a lot of people will argue and say their mom was better, but I think I can prove it. Uh, has anybody ever, ever swam in Buffalo Bio? Show of hands. You got a few. How many in their 30s have swam in Buffalo Bio? So when, when I was growing up, if we weren't on the sports field, I was down in the bio, and a couple times I was able to convince this 30-something-year-old mom to come swim down in there with me. You know, she, she could be at some gala at Houston Country Club Friday night and be down in the bio with me Saturday morning. What kind of love makes a normally sane middle-aged woman swim in the bio with her boy? <laughs> It's the equivalent of me putting on ballet slippers and a tutu and pirouetting with my daughters on stage. <laughs> she was a much better mother than I was father. Uh, when I was a kid, she told me I was part Indian, and then she raised me accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> she was not one to let the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, she gave us a lot of freedom to explore the world and explore who we were, and she would tell me that every time she forgot to pick me up from elementary school. <laughs> so I was trying to think of kind of a word to focus this eulogy on, uh, and there's so many words that fit her. Um, and the one that just kind of kept coming back to me was untamed. Um, you know, Dad kind of, or Fred kind of mentioned, Dad's by the book. He is right down the line. If it wasn't right, he wouldn't think it. It's a famous quote of his. <laughs> My mom never opened the book. She didn't care to. <laughs> she, uh, she wasn't interested in what the rules were, what the norms were. She was going to do her own thing. Uh, Dad tried his best to tame her, but it's the one part of his life where he really had a lousy batting average. <laughs> and society would try to keep her in the bounds, but she would step right over him, sometimes gracefully, oftentimes not. And it was those oftentimes not that provided the best Big Shelley stories. And if you are one of the few people who haven't heard about the time she was arrested for attempting hijacking of a Southwest Airlines flight, look me up later. It's too long to take <laughs> right now. She was strong and very independent. 
uh, but that independence can come with a price. Uh, see, Mom and I had very similar spiritual guide path, glide paths. Uh, we largely stumbled down the same path, slightly different times, but uh, almost in tandem. We were both uh, outdoors people. We loved the outdoors, hunting anytime we could get outside. And so we believed in a creator. We believed in God. Uh, I don't really know how an outdoorsman cannot believe in some sort of creator. But we were both too self-reliant and independent to give our hearts to Jesus. We just kind of kept God on the shelf, and we would pull him down as a last resort when we needed him, or have to have somebody to blame when the world turned ugly. We thought religion, including Christianity, was a crutch for the weak. Uh, we tried to keep our own weaknesses buried under a facade of self-control, and we were pretty good at it. We even fooled ourselves most of the time. God has a way of shattering that facade, though, and showing us our true strength comes when we give him our scars and our hurts, and we let, and we let our weakness shine through his strength. Mom was always a free spirit and a strong, as strong a woman as I've ever known but she really glowed in the liberation of her faith. If you know mom, she never did anything half-assed. Uh, when she gave her heart to Jesus, she gave, her, she gave him all of her great big heart. Her biggest prayer, and we talked about this a lot, dozens and dozens of times, was that her good friends and her family would take God off the shelf throw away that facade of independence and experience the freedom that comes through surrender. So on behalf of my mom, I want to invite everyone here to examine their faith. Is God on the shelf or is he at the breakfast table? Is your faith in the finished work of Jesus or is it in your own works and ability? And I'm not saying this from some lofty pulpit. If you're like me, it's very easy to slip, slowly slip into self-reliance. I have to be reminded over and over again that I'm not in control. That's just our nature, and that's kind of where I've been for the last couple of months through the summer. So much so that last Sunday during my quiet time, and this is true, I, I prayed to God. I said, God, I need you to ride with me. That night, she took mom to heaven. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. Ah. And I know God. I know God didn't take her to heaven. Because of my prayer. He took her to heaven because her time had come. But knowing that her time was coming, he gave me that prayer. Lord bless me when he gave me. He blessed me so much when he gave me my mother. And he blessed me again when he took her away. I'm the um, good looking and the smart one. So here we go. Uh, I have a reading, and um, Dad, Mom's having a ball in heaven, and uh, 
So here it is. Um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Um, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. She is in peace, and oh man, we all adore you and her, and thank you. Let's stand and sing together. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is West. I'm the third-born child with all the third-born proclivities, and um, I get to give the message today, and the bad news for y'all is I'm the weepy one of the family. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll see how this goes. I'd like to pray real quick, if I could, as much for me as anybody else. Uh, Lord, we're really grateful. Uh, you are a good God, and you are with us even in our pain. And God, you saved my mom. What a joy. What a privilege to know that she is in heaven and that you redeemed her. God, I pray that we would better understand you and your grace as a result of this time. And I pray that our hope would be in you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a little kid... My mom was scared to death of Christians. I mean, like, really scared. I, our across-the-street neighbor was a lady named Susan Baker. She might even be here. She, she's, she's great. Uh, she was a Christian, and no offense 
to those of you we've known for a long time, she was one of the only real Christians I knew. Uh, that doesn't mean that some of you weren't, but she was. And she was right across the street, and my mom loved her. My mom loved her. But if my mom thought that Susan Baker was going to talk about Jesus, and, and she saw Susan walking across the street, my mom would hide in her dressing room and get me as an eight-year-old to lie. <laughs> she'd, she'd say, tell her I'm in the bathtub. Tell her I'm at the grocery store. Like, she would avoid those conversations like they carried the black plague with them. It wasn't that she didn't like Ms. Baker. She liked Ms. Baker a lot. She was just scared to death of God. She was, she was so scared of God. And, and fear manifests itself in, in a variety of ways, doesn't it? I think we probably all know that. My mom's life motto was the best defense is a good offense. And, and so a lot of times when she was scared, she'd just go after you. And, um, and that's, that's kind of sometimes what got her in trouble. But when I became a Christian, I, I love my mom a ton. She's like the best mom in the world. And, and, and I would try to share the gospel with her. And it didn't go particularly well because I wasn't very adept at sharing the gospel. And I would just kind of run. I was like a bull in a china shop. And <clears throat> she she would, she would either try to avoid or she'd poke at me or she'd kind of bring up arguments and, and she'd be snarky and, and I'd get frustrated and I'd get more and more argumentative and, and normally those conversations would end with her calling me, quote, a little religious creepo. <laughs> and, and like, it happened so often over decades that little religious creepo and you got to know my mom to understand how this could possibly work. It became a term of endearment. Like I was like, <laughs> I got called a little religious creepo again. I think she loves me. <laughs> Once when my mom and dad went to Cabo, this is the first time I'd ever heard of anyone going to Cabo, she, she came home. And she brought me a t-shirt. <clears throat> and on the front of the t-shirt, it said, Jesus is coming. I, so I, I look at this t-shirt and I'm like, my mom, she's become a Christian. You know, like, ah. And on the back it said, everyone look busy. <laughs> it was a pretty good summary. Pretty good summary of mom's posture to all topic spiritual. I mean, like, it was just like, avoid, 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 and figure it out. I like, figure out how to get out of this conversation. It, it took me a really long time to figure out that my mom's defensiveness, my mom's defensiveness was rooted in feelings of inadequacy. She, she felt horribly unworthy of God's love. She, she felt like if she pursued God, and she wasn't sure how to pursue God, but if she pursued God, that, that God would stiff arm her. And the best defense is a good offense. She was like, okay, well, if, if that might happen, forget God. And she ran the other way. And, and I mean, she ran the other way for a long time because of these feelings of unworthiness. Now, what I want y'all to know, and I think what my mom figured out, is that those feelings of unworthiness were, were rooted 100% in a total misunderstanding of the grace of God. Like, you need, you need to understand that. Like, if you've ever felt unworthy of God's love, it's simply because you have not understood the grace of God. My mom lived for decades under the assumption that, that God would only love or accept her if, if she cleaned up, if, if she cleaned up her vocabulary. If she stopped teaching the grandkids how to cuss, like, which she did, like all of us have, I cannot believe that did not come out in our eulogies that like she taught all of our grandchildren how to, uh, all of her grandchildren how to, how to cuss. She, she was only going to be loved if she cleaned up her, her life, her language, if she stopped drinking, if she stopped smoking and she couldn't stop smoking. And how could God love her if she was addicted you know, to cigarettes. And, and, and maybe on a dark day, she saw, thought, God will only love me if I swear off having any fun whatsoever, ever. <sighs> she felt dirty 
when she thought about God. She felt dirty, dirty when she thought about God. She knew that God was clean. The spiritual word for that would be holy, maybe. And she didn't know how to bridge the gap but between her feeling dirty and God's holiness. And she was scared the gap was too wide, and, and she was so scared that the gap was so wide that she didn't even try, because if she tried, she might fail. And, and where would that leave her? So the grace of God assures us, it, it assures us that we, while we can't bridge that gap between our dirtiness and God's holiness, that, that Jesus came to earth, took on flesh, lived a perfect life, an impeccable life. He died a sinner's death, not because he sinned, because he didn't sin. He died a sinner's death, not to bear his sin, but to bear the punishment of our sins, so that we might, by grace through faith alone, receive the righteousness of God. The, the, the thing that mom wanted was, was to be whole and pure before God, and that is something that Jesus gives us by his work, not her striving. That's what she didn't get, so that we might receive the righteousness of God, and with the righteousness of God, and y'all, there is no better news than this. With the righteousness of not God comes the unconditional love of God, comes an absolute assurance that all of our sins have been washed away. Like we are made wholly right before God by God, by the work of his son Jesus. Jesus bridged the gap on our behalf. Look, somewhere along the road, 19 or 20 years ago, God's grace somehow overcame all of my mom's fears of God's rejection. And when she finally understood the gospel, she understood it, and this is, this is the best part of this. She understood it profoundly. She understood it experientially. As hard as she ran from God, all of a sudden her greatest desire was to run to God. And I tell you, as a professional Christian, it humbled me because I felt like she loved God more than I did. There's no greater story, no greater evidence of, of her adoration of God than, than the story of her baptism. And it, this was 18, 19 years ago. It was, it was after my mom had, had just become a Christian. And, and we, we have a Grace Bible Church all church retreat. And so we, we take the whole church up to Hunt, Texas. It's like 35 people. It's kind of pitiful back in the day. <laughs> and 35 people is all the men, all the women, all the children. We're counting dogs and cats at that. I mean, like it is, there's not many people there. But, but my mom on Friday night says, West, I want to get baptized. I had just had a surgically repaired left foot, and it was, it was in a cast. It could not get wet. But when the lady who gives you the shirt that says, Jesus is coming, everyone look busy, says she wants to get baptized, you figure it out, right? And, and so I get a glad trash bag, one of those big old black ones, and I, I pull it over the cast, and I get some duct tape, and I just wrap it around my leg and like cinch it up. And we're getting in the Guadalupe River. And, and so we get into the Guadalupe River, and, and the way we do it, we... We have testimonies, and my mom tells the 35 people how she became a Christian and, and her story, kind of the story I've told you. And, and then I kind of go into autopilot. I've maybe done 100 baptisms by then in my career. And, and so I go, Mom, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and because you desire to be obedient him, to him, even unto baptism, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I take her, and I say, you've been crucified with Christ, and I lay her under the Guadalupe River water, and I pull her up and I say, and you've been raised to walk in newness of life. And I'd done it a hundred times, but never like this. Never, never once anything anywhere close to this. My mom comes out of the water and she is sobbing. She is bawling. And I'm, I'm a guy, so I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> like, I'm like, ah, let's pray. You know, I pray some nonsensical prayer, 
And my mom, throughout the prayer, is sobbing. And we get out of the water, and there's you know, some people, and they give her hugs, and she's still sobbing. We get towels, and we dry off, and she's still sobbing. Finally, we get into a mule, one of those side-by-side ATVs, and we're going back up to my parents' house. And it's just my mom and I. Everybody else is you know, still hanging down by the waterfront. And she's still sobbing. It's been like 10 minutes. Like, I'm, I'm worried she's going to dehydrate type deal. And finally, like, I don't know what to say. I'm like, hey, mom, what's going on? I have no idea. And she's just like, for decades, I was so scared of God. I, I could not believe that he could possibly love me because I felt so badly about myself. And I just can't believe how amazing God's grace is, that he would save me, that he would make me new, that that he would love me, that he would call me his daughter. She's just sobbing. And, And then she says, West, we've got to tell everybody about this. And I'm like, yeah, great idea, mom. Maybe I'll start a church or something. If you think that my mom's radical conversion to Christianity made her some sort of wilting lily or like changed her personality, made her a little church mouse, you would be grossly mistaken. She, she did eventually uh, stop smoking. We've already talked about that. And, and it was 100% God who did it. It was, it was God who did it. Um, she, she also stopped teaching the grandkids new cuss words. That honestly might have been because the grandkids were getting older. <laughs> like, they kind of knew all the cuss words. Um, she, she stopped drinking as much. And, and I actually, you know, she was worried about never having any fun if she was a Christian. I think she would tell you if you, she was here today that she had a lot more fun as a Christian than she ever did before she knew Jesus. Like, I... I think she gained security and peace and joy and all of these other things that the gospel affords us, and and it made what was great even better. And you know what else? She started to figure out that that Christians, not all Christians, but some Christians can be pretty fun. They they really can. She she had a great time running around Grace Bible Church. She she became kind of a rock star a little bit amongst some of the younger women around here. Lots of of younger ladies appreciated like this really unique combination of genuine devotion to Jesus and a total absolute disregard for cultural Christian civility. Like she had none of it. And and she was just a straight shooter and and people followed her around. And it it was so fun to watch. I mean, I was so incredibly proud of her. About 10 years ago, we were building this building, and my mom was on the design team. There were like four ladies on the design team. It wasn't like just an interior design team. It was, it was like the design of everything. Team. It was arch- I mean, they, they had input into everything in this building, and if you like this building, it's because you like my mom's taste. Her fingerprints, as was said earlier, are all over this place. And, and she loved these ladies that she worked with on the design team, so much so that when the project was done, she was really sad because she wasn't going to have an excuse to get together with them as frequently as she had been for the last year. I mean, like, it was so fun for her. But, but one of the things, an interesting story, it's, it just shows you who my mom was even in Christ. Um, this, this cross back here in the window, that's, that's how it was designed, okay? So that, like, that's in the architectural blueprints, that cross was, was there. But when we were getting toward the end of the project, uh, when they put that in, it wasn't a cross. There were two horizontal beams, and so there were, there were six panes instead of four panes. And you know, we're at the end of the project. I'm, I'm kind of tired of it, honestly. I'm like, I'm, just let us move in and, and get going. And, and you know, six panes, I was like, it's fine, whatever. My mom was having no part of it. Like she, she was so furious that there was another beam. She's like, the design said cross. And I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. And she's like, she gets up in my face. I mean, like spitting on me type mad. And she's like, West, you go give them hell till they give us that cross. 
And she wasn't trying to be funny. Like that, that was not her being cute. That was her being serious. It was funny, but she wasn't trying to be funny. So look, if, if you love the cross, if you love the cross, first you should thank God. But if you love that cross, you should thank my mom. Because I promise you, that's a cross today because of who God made my mom to be. A few months ago, I preached a sermon on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And my mom came up to me after the sermon and she said she wanted that passage preached at her funeral. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it for you. And I, I know I've gone on a long time, so I'm going to keep this pretty short. But I think it has impact on who she was and who I think God wants us to be today. If I can read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he said, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Since indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It's a lot of metaphors there. I'm going to try to keep it real simple. The big picture, Paul is making a contrast between our temporal bodies, which he calls tents, which are being destroyed. My mom, it was very evident she had COPD, but it's happening to all of us, whether we're willing to acknowledge it or not. It's a contrast between our temporal bodies, these earth tents that are being destroyed, and the eternal resurrection bodies we will one day enjoy as a promise to those who have believed in Jesus. Those bodies won't ever be destroyed. And my mom, she looked at verse 2, and she could totally identify with it. It says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And she knew that her body was failing her. I preached this sermon six months ago. She was advanced in her COPD, and she longed for a heavenly body. Verse 3 talks about nakedness, and, and that can be uncomfortable, especially in church, and I, I get that. But what you need to know is it's not really about clothing. The nakedness that is talked about in verses 3 and 4 is a reference to something the Bible very frequently talks about. Uh, nakedness ever since the fall, ever since Genesis 3, means something. To be naked is to live exposed by and to the consequence of sin. It's, it's to feel the shame of not having enough hands to cover over the things that make us uncomfortable. And in heaven, in these new bodies that we will receive, we will not suffer the effects of the nakedness that has been caused by our sin. In fact, verses 4 and 5 talk a little bit about that. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Just to cut to the chase, Paul says that God through Jesus, has, has flipped the script. And let, let me explain what I mean by that. We spend, my mom spent, we spend, a lot of our time in this life trying to compensate, trying to overcome our own feelings of shame, don't we? Like we, we, we spend a whole lot of time not feeling totally whole, and, and so what we do is we, we try to achieve it can be in sports when we're in junior high and high school, and, and then later on it's socially, and, and maybe later after that it's, it's through our professional careers, and, and we're trying to make ourselves feel adequate again so that we feel clothed. And that's what my mom did for so long. Like maybe if, if I quit smoking, I'll feel better and I can approach God, and she couldn't, and she couldn't. And the more you try to compensate, even if you succeed, you can't escape 
your nakedness, the shame. And so what we do is we spend our lives sowing what is, in effect, religious fig leaves, trying to make ourselves feel whole, but my mom, and I'm pretty sure you, can't make yourself feel whole. Paul can't wait for heaven in verses 4 and 5 because life swallows up death. That's what the text says. Security in Christ swallows up shame. Immortality swallows up mortality. God flipped the the script. He reversed the curse. This is all made possible according to verse 5 by the work of Jesus. And the indwelling Holy Spirit who changes us gradually and from the inside out is a guarantee of God's promises to be fully fulfilled when we go to our reward. I'll finish with verses 6 through 9. So we are always of good courage. We know that while that we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, says it twice. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. What's Paul's point here? Simple. The best is yet to come. Back in the old days, so I hear at churches, they'd have potlucks, and, and all the ladies of the church would bring their best covered dish for a Sunday afternoon potluck, and, and kids were fired up about the potlucks because they, they would eat mac and cheese or you know hot dogs Monday through Saturday, but mom was going to pull out the stops on Sunday because she's bringing it before the whole church, and all the moms did, and so there's this feast at the church Sunday potluck. And, and after everyone had just gorged themselves on wonderful food, the, the moms would come around and they would pick up the dishes. And, and what the kids always longed to hear is for the moms to say, hey, keep your forks. Keep your forks. Because the kids understood that if, if the mom said, keep your forks, dessert was coming. The best was yet to come. The best was yet to come. Last Sunday was the best day of my mom's life. I think I can prove it. Sunday morning, she got up and she came to church and she sat right there with her husband of 62 years. That is a grace of God, 62 years of marriage. Sunday morning, she sang I'll Fly Away, which was absolutely her favorite song in the whole wide world. And in the providence of God on the last day she lived, she sang I'll Fly Away. We're about to sing I'll Fly Away If you people don't sing that song (laughs) from the depths of your souls, I'll march right back up here and we're going to start it over. I'm not kidding you. (laughs) Like, that's not meant to be funny. That's serious. She's saying, I'll fly away. That, That is a grace of God. She listened to a spectacularly mediocre sermon that day. And she loved it because she had a bias for the preacher. And that is a grace from God. And then she went after lunch with Big Lou and my two daughters, Rebecca and Annie Kate. And they had a great lunch. And then after that, she went with my brother Lewis and his daughter Emery and her new husband Lachlan And mom loved all three of them. And they hung out in the afternoon. And then after that, she went to 5027 Green Tree Road, the house that she had lived in for 50 some odd years, the house that she had raised her children in. And she got to the house. And then God took her home. And when she got to heaven in an instant direct from her house on Green Tree. I don't know that it was a sermon, but it was not spectacularly mediocre. It was just spectacular. I promise you, it was the best day of her life. Death for my mom, death for anyone who is in Christ, isn't defeat. It's commencement. 
I'll leave you with verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Let's pray. Father, this hurts, but you are good. Your promises are sure. Your love is unconditional. And you are in the business of redeeming sinners and making them saints. God, I'm so grateful for the legacy of Shelley Flato Brazelton, my mom. I pray, Father, that we would learn from her of the goodness of your gospel and that we would trust in that goodness and that we would not strive to earn your love. We would receive it based wholly in what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And I pray that we would live in the freedom that you have afforded us in the gospel just like my mom so powerfully did. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, you heard the man. Let's stand and sing. Some bright morning. Some bright morning when this life is over. Hey guys, thanks uh, again for being with us. Wes, Wes just mentioned this. That was Shelly's favorite song. Uh, and, and so it is a fitting way for us to close it out. But, but even more so, if, if you listen to the words when you sang it, it, it's a delight to think that just as we sang right now, Shelly's weary days are over and she is in a land where joy shall never end. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here today. I know it means so much to Lou. Uh, I know it means so much to, to Lewis and Shelly and Fred and West uh, for you guys to spend a portion of your Friday afternoon sympathizing with them, remembering a life well lived, but, but most importantly, celebrating Shelly's homecoming. 
Uh, after I close us in prayer, uh, we'd ask that you guys sit down and remain seated as the family makes its way out. Uh, we'd ask that you stay seated for several minutes uh, so that they can get back in the living room and get situated. Everyone here is invited to the reception in the living room just beyond the foyer. Uh, I'll fly away. We'll play one more time when the house music fades. You guys are welcome to join them back there. So, uh, that said, I'm going to close this out in prayer, and I'm going to be reading our prayer from the book of Jude. So if you would, please bow your heads with me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. bars have flown I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah bye bye I'll fly